ABC News. World News Sunday. Here's Forrest Sawyer. Good evening. Our lead story tonight is in Israel, where the murder of seven Palestinian workers has stirred the worst violence there in months. A lone Israeli gunman attacks the workers in a field outside Tel Aviv. The Israeli government condemned the attack, but angry Palestinians poured into the streets, and by the end of the day, at least seven more Palestinians were dead, hundreds more injured. ABC's Dean Reynolds has our report. The victims were Palestinian laborers looking for a day's work in Israel. They had gathered on this roadside when, witnesses said, an Israeli dressed in army fatigues told them to line up and then began methodically shooting them with an assault rifle. Seven men were killed and at least 11 wounded in the shooting that occurred just five miles from Tel Aviv. The gunman, a 21-year-old former soldier discharged early from the army for mental problems, later recreated the incident for police. His motive was unclear. Prime Minister Shamir said he was shocked and saddened by the shooting, and he called for calm. I hope that the Palestinian Arab population will not uh, utilize this atmosphere for increasing violence and bloodshed. Later, there were Palestinian and Israeli protesters outside Shamir's residence. When they vocally denounced his hardline policies, the police moved in to disperse them. <laughs> Palestinian leaders said Shamir's right-wing attitude has invited anti-Arab violence. We place the full blame on the Israeli government and the Israeli political circles for preparing for this and for perpetuating such massacres constantly. As word of the shooting spread to the Gaza Strip, angry and despondent Palestinians poured into the streets to confront the army. What followed was one of the bloodiest days of the uprising. At least four more Palestinians were shot to death by Israeli troops, and stretcher after stretcher carried some of the 600 wounded, including women and children. On the West Bank, there were large demonstrations reminiscent of the earliest days of the uprising. Two more Palestinians were killed in clashes today, and at least 50 were wounded from army gunfire. A massive reinforcement of troops helped to put curfews on most of the occupied territories by this afternoon. But as one Israeli security official said, the fires of the uprising have been rekindled. Dean Reynolds, ABC News, Tel Aviv. Racial violence erupted in South Africa's gold mining belt today. Rioting blacks set fire to houses and stores in Tabong Township, where blacks have been boycotting white businesses for several weeks. The riots subsided when police fired into the crowds, killing at least three people and wounding 20 others. Turning to Eastern Europe, Romania, the first free elections there in 53 years went smoothly, though a little slowly. Some voters had to line up for three hours and final results are not expected until Friday. One observer noting that Romania was ruled by a brutal dictator only a year ago said, what we are witnessing is a miracle. Here's ABC's Mike Lee. The polling stations were kept open later than scheduled tonight because so many Romanians were still lined up to vote. The front runner had always been the interim president, Jan Iliescu, the ex-communist who has promised a Western-style market economy. But his critics, some of whom continued to protest on election day, claim that the communist elite still control Romania. The two presidential candidates with no communist past and little apparent chance of winning were Radu Campanu of the Liberal Party and Jan Ratsu of the Peasants Party. For Romanians, it was a proud and historic day. Many walked miles just to mark their ballots, alone in a booth, with no party boss looking over their shoulder. I feel good. I feel more, much more free. I'm very happy, really. I'm hopeful, but still a little bit skeptical. Even these children of the late dictator Nikolai Ceausescu were allowed to vote in a police station. They are awaiting trial on criminal charges. Romania's future relations with the U.S. and other Western nations, its very economic survival, will depend in large part upon how fair this election process has been. The three parties have any complaints about what's happened thus far? Uh, Observers from the U.S. and other countries monitored portions of the election process and will release their findings within the next few days. Some Romanians spared a thought for those who were gunned down during the uprising which made free elections possible. 
many of them would not have been old enough to vote today. Mike Lee, ABC News, Bucharest. And coming up, the first look at outer space through the eyes of Hubble. World News Sunday, brought to you by AT&T. Did you know that if your business isn't using AT&T, your long-distance company could be wasting your time? Other long-distance companies take over 40% longer than AT&T to connect calls. And all those extra seconds spent waiting can add up to hundreds of lost hours. So many hours, it's like paying someone to sit around for over a month to do absolutely nothing. Productivity, another AT&T advantage. Dessert for 750 at 8 o'clock sharp. It takes expertise, artistry, and most of all, total concentration. With no time for minor arthritis pain. That's why there's the concentrated power of Anison. Anison concentrates 23% more medicine in each tablet. More medicine than regular strength aspirin for fast, effective pain relief. Anison relief gets arthritis pain out of your way. Anison, concentrated for powerful pain relief. It was a long time coming, but the celebrated Hubble Space Telescope finally sent its first pictures of outer space back to Earth today. The Hubble's been plagued by so many glitches that astronomers really weren't expecting much from today's first test. But as Jim Slade reports, they got a big and a welcome surprise. They looked through Hubble, and this is what they saw. This was first light, the first time a new telescope sees the stars. Astronomers came prepared to explain why it doesn't look so great yet, but they didn't but, have to. Uh, gee, it was great. And uh, to imagine now that we're going to go another factor seven or eight before we're done in the next month or so, gee whiz, that's going to be <laughs> really something to look at. Here's what he's talking about. Professor Westfall's team took the picture on the right through Hubble. On the left is one taken by a ground-based telescope in Chile. The picture on the left is what is commonly done on really good nights at, uh, at uh, Las Campanas. And of course, that's one nice city of ST is it's gonna be this way or better always. What's so intriguing is that star in the upper right. Actually, it's two stars in the same line of sight. Until today, they didn't know for sure it was a double star. So they've actually learned something even though they had no intention of doing so with this first rough picture. Today's test was merely an engineering run to see that they could find the stars and focus on them. Professor Westfall and his colleagues see years ahead of exploring parts of the universe that have been totally blanked out for them by Earth's obscuring atmosphere. I think maybe the most fun stuff is going to be these pictures that are not pointed at some specific thing. That's where we're going to find mysteries. That time's coming. Jim Slade, ABC News, Goddard Space Flight Center, Maryland. Down on Earth, weather was still very much in the news. Torrential downpours dumping up to 13 inches of rain in central Arkansas overnight. And that caused flash flooding that turned streets and hot springs into rivers, sweeping away many cars and bridges and stranding residents of lakefront homes on their rooftops. More than 200 families were forced to evacuate. In Florida, a flotilla of private boats piloted by Cuban exiles set sail from Key West today. Their mission, to stage a rally for democracy on the edge of communist Cuba's territorial waters. ABC's Peter Collins reports. They left at dawn about three dozen private boats, all of them with Cuban-American exiles on board. Some of the men had fought in the ill-fated Bay of Pigs invasion 30 years ago. Now they were headed for the waters off Cuba with a message for Fidel Castro. We want freedom and democracy in Cuba, so our brotherhood in Cuba knows that we are behind them. The plan was to sail within 13 miles of Cuba, just off the island's territorial limits. U.S. Coast Guard ships escorted the Cubans and passed on a warning from Havana not to get too close. So, most of the widely scattered flotilla stayed 20 miles offshore. Today is the 82nd anniversary of Cuba's independence from Spain, and the idea was to deliver a message of hope to Cubans still living under Castro's communist regime. Most of these Cubans fervently believe the collapse of communism in Europe means Castro is next. Castro knows that we are on his back demanding the freedom of Cuba. There was no official reaction from Cuba and Castro's armed forces stayed clear of the flotilla. For many of the exiles, this was as close as they have ever gotten to their homeland since they left and just making the trip was exciting. 
Peter Collins, ABC News, Key West, Florida. When we return a different kind of confrontation, some Michigan residents with a top Japanese official over lost jobs and unfair trade. People just don't understand. Constipation can really tie you down. They say, take a laxative and hope it doesn't go to work on the way to the ball game. Oh. Then I found a simple solution. Daily fiber therapy with Metamucil. It's safe, not a harsh chemical. I can even take Metamucil daily for the extra fiber I need to get regular and stay that way. That's important to me and a lot of little people. Metamucil, and you can stay regular for the rest of your life. Every evening, we pack over 700,000 passengers onto our planes. No drinks are served. No meals are prepared. We have our customers love our service. Like our UPS Next Day Air Letter. Guaranteed overnight delivery to any address coast to coast. And at just $9, far less than other companies charge. No one seems to mind that there's no in-flight movie. one of 570 million refund locations for American Express traveler's checks. Just phone, and you can get a refund hand delivered virtually anywhere. Is that you, hon? Don't let anything ruin your vacation. Take only American Express traveler's checks. Don't leave home without them. In recent years, doctors have discovered a flaw in eggs. They're extremely high in cholesterol. And a diet high in cholesterol and fat can contribute to the risk of heart disease. Nutritionists at Fleischmann's have found a way to overcome this flaw with Fleischmann's Egg Beaters, the only egg substitute that's 99% real egg with zero cholesterol and zero saturated fat. Next time you'd love an egg, crack open a carton. Fleischmann's Egg Beaters, the great tasting egg without a flaw. There was an unusual and potentially explosive town meeting today outside Detroit. People who live there, many of whom are out of work because of Japanese competition, got to confront one of Japan's top government officials. ABC's Sheila Cast was there. He is Shintaro Ishihara, an outspoken member of the Japanese parliament. His controversial book argues Japan should be tougher on the U.S., should say no to U.S. trade demands. At home, his views are popular. But today, Ishihara is near Detroit. Everywhere, there are signs of the impact of Japanese competition. New showplace plants operated by the Japanese. Parts manufacturers feeling the loss of markets. Old factories like this Cadillac plant shut down entirely. They have devastated Detroit because they have ripped the bottom out of it. My estimate is directly and indirectly you're talking about a million jobs in the Detroit metro area that went to Tokyo. Benny McAuliffe, a union shop steward, has worked at General Motors for 18 years. But he doesn't know what will happen in his division when the UAW contract runs out in September. Something will give, especially if we keep losing work to foreign trade. Yeah, they're going to sit and tell us, hey, we've got too, much peop too many people and we've got to cut them. McAuliffe confronted Ishihara today at a town meeting arranged by Congressman Sander Levin. Would you like to see the U.S. economy falter? Oh, no, Ishihara responded through his interpreter, and he acknowledged Japan should open its markets. Still, he insisted the imbalance in trade between the two countries comes not uh, from the closeness of the Japanese market, but more from the weakness of the competitiveness of the United States industry. Surprisingly, the crowd found much to agree with in Ishihara's argument. Our problems are not with Mr. Ishihara or the Japanese. They're in Washington. And if I was in the Japanese shoes, I would deal the same way. We shouldn't blame the Japanese for some of our shortcomings. So I thank you. The people here want the American consumer to say no to Japanese products and the American government to say no to closed markets. Sheila Cast, ABC News, Southfield, Michigan. Now Japan's neighbor, China. It was one year ago today that China's communist leaders imposed martial law in the face of massive pro-democracy demonstrations in Tiananmen Square. Since then, open defiance of the government has all but disappeared, and Beijing is theoretically back to normal. 
but as ABC's Todd Carroll reports, China's leaders are still very much on their guard. The Chinese people learned about the martial law decree one year ago from a shrill speech by the hardline premier, Li Peng, and another by the president, Yang Shang Kun. Military helicopters flew over central Beijing then, but they could not enforce martial law on a defiant population from the air. It took a military onslaught and a bloodbath two weeks later to do that. Martial law was technically lifted in January, but many army troops and paramilitary police never left. They still occupy a massive history museum. They march around Tiananmen Square. Troop trucks even drive through it or patrol the university district. People here will tell you over the last year, a new terror has set in to prop up an unpopular dictatorship. This weekend, television viewers saw Li Peng meeting the top North Korean police official, saying China needs better equipment to ensure security. They also saw their president in Brazil today, where he told reporters that Chinese young people were being taught to resist Western ideology. And there is evidence of that. 200 freshmen who've been forced to undergo training at a remote military base were on Beijing University campus this week showing off what they've learned. But there's no evidence that any of this has eroded the underlying anti-government mood here. Many ordinary people say they're just waiting for new winds to come again and sweep away the terror. Todd Carroll, ABC News, Beijing. The North African nation of Sudan was struck by a major earthquake today measuring 7.5 on the Richter scale, which means it was capable of causing widespread destruction. The epicenter was near Juba, southern Sudan's largest city, but government officials say there appear to be no casualties or damage. Still, much of the area is so isolated, any news could take days or weeks to arrive. And we'll be back with Ray Gandalf and today's sports highlights. There you are, going along, feeling on top of the world. Then out of the blue, constipation. You feel bloated, twisted. You just can't go on. And fiber, it's so slow. You want fast medicine. X-Lax, it's the right medicine. Medical experts agree. X-Lax gives your system back the natural fluids it needs to put you back on top of the world again. In hours, not days. Today's X-Lax, the right medicine. Fatty Dawson was one of my best friends. I don't believe I can stand it another 40 years. <laughs> well, I've insured two generations. Doug has insured the next generation. It's the kind of family you want to do business with. He married, I think, probably better than his wife did. After 40 years as friends and neighbors, a second generation of Donaldsons is insuring a third generation of McCormicks through New York Life. I guess you'd say we have to pull each other's wagon when we can. New York Life, the company you keep. What's fair is fair. And frankly, Bryce Pfister is the fairest faucet of them all. Starting with the fabulous finishes they offer outside, right down to the feat of engineering that's inside. The quality is formidable, thanks to a heart of solid brass. And another fine feature is how affordable it is. So find yourself a Price Pfister, the fabulous faucet with a funny name. If you heard about a breakfast that helps keep you going all morning, you'd think it was big news, right? Well, it was for me. It's breakfast with grape nut cereal. I heard try it for a week and see how good you feel all morning. I feel great. I mean, it's got what it takes to help keep you going. It's packed with complex carbohydrates. It's a natural energy source, but it also tastes so good. It's hearty. Just try it for a week yourself. Breakfast with grape nuts helps keep you going strong all morning long. The biggest polluter in America is the federal government. Why Uncle Sam doesn't face the same penalties for breaking the law. Watch Peter Jennings on ABC's World News tonight, this week. Let's check in on sports now. Ray Gandalf joins us from New York with a look at one rookie race car driver who gave it his best trying to graduate to big time at Indy. And, of course, there's the NBA's Eastern Conference Final. Ray? Thank you, Forrest. In the first game of that Eastern Conference final series, Detroit's defense smothered the Chicago Bulls, and Joe Dumars took care of the Piston offense, scoring 27 points, 18 of them in the third quarter, when the Pistons took control of the game. 
Monica Sellis resisted the irresistible force and moved the immovable object, beating Steffi Graf in the finals of the German Open tennis tournament and breaking Graf's winning string at 66 matches in a row. On this, the final day of qualifying trials for the Indianapolis 500 next Sunday, 22-year-old Buddy Lazier was graduated into the big time, whether he made it into the race or whether he didn't. From A to V, from Andretti to Vukovic, auto racing is a father and son sport, even for a not-so-famous father and his indie rookie son. Bob Lazier raced once at Indy, finished 19th. Buddy Lazier, trying to qualify this past week, learned about racing literally at his father's knee. When he was uh, uh, eight, he would sit on my lap and do the steering. And, uh, you know, I didn't see any need to slow down because he, he was able to steer so well, even at whatever speed we were going. I used to sit in the race cars and look in there and say, God, you know, if I could just reach the pedals, I can do that. I know I can do that. And uh, I can remember being back, at, you know, about six years old, when, when we had to sneak into the pits, they used to uh, put me in the back trunk to, to get me in the racetracks because I was too young. Buddy's attempt to qualify at Indy this year started badly when his car crashed on the first day of practice runs. He came out of it unscathed and began working with a backup car. His chances of breaking into the 33-man field were slim. But before yesterday's trials began, Bob Lazier was hopeful. Maybe things won't be done correctly and we won't make the race or have another accident or something on this sort of. So right now it is definitely the makings of a, of a wonderful weekend and a wonderful part of life in general. Buddy Lazier couldn't make it today to a part of this wonderful weekend. Graduation ceremonies at Curry College in Massachusetts. Robert. Buddy Lazier, candidate for Bachelor of Arts. I really think that having the college degree with the way motor racing has evolved is going to make me a better race car driver uh, in the future. And being a race car driver helped Lazier earn his degree. He got a semester's credit for his Indy experience. He designed and wrote his media brochures. And in a sport that devotes its every moment to selling something, Lazier's degree in marketing gives him a leg up. And the kid can drive. Yesterday, he qualified as the 33rd man, the man on the bubble. But he had to wait until 7 o'clock tonight, Eastern Time, to find out if another driver had bettered his time, bumped him out of the race. Even if that happened, it was still a wonderful weekend for Buddy Lazier. Just the fact that I'm here and, and the fact that I'm graduating is, is enough for me. And, uh, and in terms of, of how the race goes, well, that's all really gravy. And uh, I'm just happy to be here. Well, Buddy Lazier didn't have to wait quite till 7 o'clock at 5.45 this afternoon, Eastern Time. Buddy Lazier's bubble burst. Another driver beat his speed by a hearty five miles an hour. So Lazier is out of the race but nobody took his diploma away from him. Forrest? There are more races ahead. Thanks, Ray. Thanks. When we come back, it is called Gorbachev Fever, and this time it's taking Minnesota by storm. Fifties nifty. And to extend these good years, we eat right, exercise, and to be sure, we take new Geritol Extend with all the vitamins folks over 50 need. New Geritol Extend, because you're as young as you feel. The bill's twice as big as usual. Because, honey, you ate twice as much. With extra strength, Tum ZX, even twice the heartburn's no sweat. It's twice as strong, twice as fast as regular Rolaids. Look at me enjoying corn on the cob, thanks to Super Poly Grip. Super Poly Grip forms a seal that holds so tight, many denture wearers can enjoy more of their favorite foods, even corn on the cob. Super Poly Grip. Years ago, for minor arthritis pain, my doctor recommended the pain reliever and prescription Motrin. Today, he recommends Motrin IB. Motrin IB. No prescription needed. It's powerful relief from minor arthritis pain. Motrin IB. Doctor recommended pain relief. 
Monday on Good Morning America, a scientific first, test tube, tigers. Then later in the week, John Lithgow, Timothy Busfield, and Debbie Gibson here on Good Morning America. The Bush-Gorbachev summit is now only 10 days away. And arms control experts and trade officials are not the only ones working round the clock getting ready. The proud residents of Minnesota are busy too. Gorbachev is traveling there for a visit when the Washington hoopla is over. It's only a six hour stop, but as Kathleen Delasky reports, that's enough to create Gorby mania. Already the t-shirts are coming off the presses. Gorbachev wants to see the heartland of America and the folks are sprucing it up with 260,000 petunias. Even school children want a piece of the politician. Ninth graders are writing him letters. Make sure you make a comment in there that uh, we'd like to have him personally visit the school. The town of Moscow, Minnesota is offering country charm and even rubles, Richard rubles. We will show him a good rural community, how local government works here in the United States. They want to be close to him. It's almost like, as if a rock star were coming here and we were a, a, a state of teenagers. And some are acting like teenagers. This rock and roll radio station is running a Gorbachev birthmark look-alike contest. And what does it look like? The USSR without Latvia. <laughs> no Soviet leader has visited the Midwest since Khrushchev toured an Iowa farm in 1959. He marveled at food processing and hot dogs, but he was not interested in capitalism. But today's capitalists see an opening for new commercial adventures. The local barons of agriculture, medical, and computer technology are looking for deals with the Soviets. They are thrilled that Gorbachev has requested a meeting. He selected Minnesota. I think there's, that indicates uh, that we have something that's of interest to him. The Soviets have not told Perpich exactly why they picked the Twin Cities, but that does not dampen his enthusiasm. The governor's re-election bid was in trouble, but since he was the one who invited Gorbachev, his supporters say the visit is turning his campaign around. It's almost as if the clouds have parted and the good Lord himself decided to get involved in Rudy Perpich's campaign. Only a few local curmudgeons are throwing cold water on Gorby fever. Instead of recognizing him for his achievements, they're all trying to grab his coattails to further their own agendas. It seems everyone wants to take advantage of the Gorbachev glitter. But the question is, how much glitter can he leave behind after a six-hour visit? Kathleen Delasky, ABC News, Minneapolis. And that is our report for tonight. Tom Gerald will have more news later on the weekend report. I'm Forrest Sawyer. For all of us here at ABC News. Good night. From Washington, this has been World News Sunday. The American Agenda, weekdays on ABC's World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. This has been a presentation of ABC News, where more Americans get their news than from any other source.